baptism, all you have is the same thing somebody who has a degree in electrical engineering has, a rote knowledge of a process, not a relationship with Jesus. It's both. It's both. And they have to come together. Chapter 11. This is where the vision begins. Now, this is going to sound like it's a history class. There's a reason. This is a history class. And if you liked high school history, you'll love it. If you liked college history, you're weird. Actually, I was one of those weird people. I really liked history. I thought it was significant. The old saying, those that don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. I believe that that's true. Uh, history isn't always repeated, but what happens is frequently extremely close by the same causative factors. Daniel 1.1. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to con and, and uh, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. The same angel who strengthened Daniel was the same one who strengthened Darius. Think about this. Darius was ungodly. Darius was a conqueror. Yet the scripture tells us that is the leader of the Medes and the Persians, this angel came and strengthened Darius in the same way that he just strengthened Daniel. This tells us that throughout history, God has worked in the lives of those that we would never suspect have any contact, that have any purpose for God. And God has used ungodly men and ungodly women in ungodly regimes to bring about his plan for the, for the world. God uses ungodly uh, secularists to move his agenda forward. There is a tension in the demonic realm. Even Satan is God's unwilling servant. God has every demon has Satan on a short leash. They have a certain power for certain purposes. Now the problem with this is when you make these statements is that there are people who go off the deep end with this demon routine and they become more interested in the demons than they do in Jesus. And they seem to draw to themselves teachers that do really odd stuff. There was a group of people running around for a while that if you paid them to come to your church, they would come in and they would get involved in some hoopla ceremony and they would tell you the name of the demons who were over your city. And when you ask them, where did you get the name of the demons? They would say, because we are believers, we demand it that they give us their names. Let me see if I got this straight. You're going to ask beings that are committed to the father of lies to tell you their true names. Right? Is that what it is? Completely whack jobs. It's a whacked out deal. People who become so interested in the demons that they don't get the gist that the view that we have from this portion of scripture <clears throat> simply that there's stuff going on in spiritual realms that we don't completely understand. But we do understand this, that God does what's necessary and whoever it's necessary to use to get to the place where he wants us to be and that it's going to happen in his time, his way, and no demon ever goes any further than he allows and has no power that he does not grant. And when the title deed to the earth is delivered, it all stops. Now let me give you one more thought. It's a little sidetrack, but I think it's important. 
If you've ever wondered why God allows sickness, why he allows children to be murdered, born deformed, why he allows millions of people in a country that claims as the base of their heart and soul to be equity for all men, to dehumanize unborn children and murder them, why now there are moves in legislatures that for economic reasons to murder old people because they are inconvenient. Why does he allow this if he has the power to stop it? Here's the answer. The book of Romans teaches us that in the day that he puts a stop to those situations is the day that every human being is locked into the decision that they have made concerning Jesus at that instant. And no one who has not bent the knee to Jesus at that moment may be saved. As long as there is sickness in this world, as long as there is death, as long as there is injustice, the door is open for a decision for Jesus. When we have family members who are sick, to a degree and in a certain way of looking at it, they are living proof that the door is open. There is a chance. That's why I'm so vehemently, adamantly against this notion of putting people to death, starving them and making them die of thirst because we think they are not cognitively capable of being valuable. No man can tell me what the Spirit of God is doing in someone who cannot communicate in a synergistic way to others when there are believing, praying Christians and family members that are holding them before God every day, just the way Daniel did Israel. I will not accept that. I have no idea. Whenever I go to visit someone who seems to have slipped into unconsciousness and the doctor says that they are at the end, I talk to them. I speak to them about their salvation. And I trust Almighty God to bring that message through. Because I believe nothing, nothing is out of the hand of God. There are no possibilities in that situation that God cannot perform. And that's why I urge you, if you know somebody in Oregon, literally, for the love of God, get a hold of them and tell them what their legislature and greedy horrible, despicable, so-called advocacy organizations and insurance companies are doing for people who are inconveniently victims of dementia or mental illness. Tell you something else too. This also tells us that there are entire governments that are acting under the direction of regional demons. Uh, visiting Matt Shea one time, uh, a legislator that I respect in the state of Washington, I was in his office and we prayed together and he made the comment and it really stuck with me. He was speaking of the halls of government in Olympia and he says, I'll tell you, he says, evil walks these halls. That is a man who is aware. And if we are ever able to achieve statehood as an eastern half of the state, he is the man that I will actively support with my time and with my money to be the first governor of the state. Well, now that I've managed to quite successfully get off track. <coughs> verse two. And now I will tell you the truth, behold, Three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all the uh, all, uh, against 
uh, all against the realm of Greece. Clear as mud, right? Everybody understands the prophecy now. Okay? I'm going to, at the end of this, give you a list of books that I think you will find extremely important. Two of them are commentaries that are written that speak specifically to a correlation between world events and the 11th chapter of Daniel, Daniel in general, okay? And the other are the works of Josephus, a Jewish historian. And I'm going to recommend something that might seem curious to some folks, but I am going to recommend two books of the Apocrypha. Uh, the Apocrypha are books that are included in the Catholic Bible, but are not included in the King James Bible. The reason was that they were, not because they weren't considered accurate, but because they were not considered to be inspired, okay? History books are not inspired, but they may be accurate. The two books are First and Second Maccabees. First and Second Maccabees will cover part of what is being spoken of toward the end, or at least up to the 32nd verse of the 11th chapter of Daniel. And it is very, very accurate to the times. So at any rate, please don't let me get by without sharing the names of those commentaries with you. I have them written down. So second verse. Remember when Daniel is hearing this, this is prehistory to him. This is prophetic, even though it is history to us. First, the Medo-Persian Empire will have three more kings to follow the current king. The fourth one will have the greatest strength of all and will have the greatest riches. He will go up and after the fact of that, that last king will be actively involved in go up, going up against an emerging, an emerging and stronger empire the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. Historically, the fourth king was Arctic Xerxes. The first went to war and lost to the Greeks. Verse three, then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion, a dominion and do according to his will. Alexander the Great, arises and unites the entire Greek empire. Verse four, and when he is risen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others beside, uh, besides these. This begins to speak to what happened after Alexander dies. Alexander dies, his four principal generals divide the kingdom in quarters. And when the kingdom is divided, they each separate as a united kingdom and the generals themselves become kings. Look how accurately this is stated. Remember I said that if you ever needed something to prove that there is a God, it is the fulfillment of specific prophecy. Now remember, Alexander is not born when Daniel is hearing this. He tells them that after the fourth Medo-Persian king is defeated, that the Greeks, a united Greek empire, is going to come together and is going to become the strongest and is going to overtake the Medo-Persian empire. And that they that kingdom is going to come apart. And the king of that kingdom will not have a progeny that will become the hereditary king. But rather, it will be divided and there will be a king over each of the four sections. Now, how do you think that? How do you predict something like that when the custom is for hereditary progeny to take over for the king? There's only one way. That's to recognize that to God, there is no past, there is no future, only present. He sees everything in the now. 
He can speak authoritatively to what is. And if he is a being that knows all things, sees all things, and is all powerful to control all things, that is the definition of God. He goes on. He says that they were going to be uprooted. Even others besides these. Fifth verse. Also the king of the south shall become strong as well as one of his princes. And he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be great dominion. Remember, Daniel is hearing about something that doesn't exist yet. There's no way to put names to it. We know that this is the story of two of the strongest kings, the northern kingdom being Syria, the southern kingdom being Egypt, or what remains of the Greek empire. Verse 5 begins the history of warfare that happens between the northern Greek generals and the southern Greek generals. The northern kingdom being Syria, the southern being Greece or Egypt, that was not the name of these kingdoms in Daniel's time. That's why he simply refers to them as the northern and the southern kingdoms. Now, why doesn't God tell us what's happening? You notice he's only talking about the north and the south as we go through this. Some people use the argument to say, well, why doesn't he mention the rest of the world? Why isn't he telling us what's happening in Japan? Why is it he doesn't tell us, tell us what's happening in South America? That's proof that the Bible isn't true because he doesn't even know those places exist. No. Go back to the 10th chapter and the 14th verse. He is told by God's messenger the reason he is being told this message. He's having this reveal. Who is it for? His people. That's all it concerns. He's revealing events that have to do with the Jews. That's why he doesn't mention the rest of the world. Not because he doesn't know what's going on in the rest of the world. That argument is fallacious. Okay? We'll move on as soon as I can get my page turned here. I wrote this down in detail because I didn't want to blow any of the history. The kings of either of the two generals, the other two generals aren't mentioned. Why? That's because if you look at the geography between Syria and Egypt, God knew just what he was doing. When you look at a map, he knew just what he was doing, placing Israel where he did because it was as if he planted Israel in the middle of a four lane highway and when they attacked out of the north they went over Israel like a tin can in the road and when they came up from Egypt and attacked he went they went through Israel and ran them over he put them in a position where what he told them in Deuteronomy was an imminent possibility when he told them what would happen if they didn't follow after him with a whole heart. He set it up right to begin with. He doesn't mention the kingdoms of the other two generals because they are geographically placed where they don't have to run through the Holy Land in order to go after each other. And these two kings for hundreds of years through their progeny have a running war. And it goes through Israel time and time again. That's what's happening. And the remainder of the explanation up to verse 32 is the detail of the Grecian and Syrian wars. He goes on. Sixth verse. And at the end of some years, they shall join forces. For the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither, he, and, and neither he nor his authority shall stand. 
but she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who strength, who strengthened her in those times. Now that's cryptic, but it's extremely specific. Specific. Let me give you the backstory. All right. Two warring kings and two warring kingdoms. They're at each other's throats. They finally come to the conclusion that something's got to give. So what happens is this. There's an alliance of the two kingdoms. The king of the southern kingdom, Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus, and the king of of Syria, the northern king, kingdom, Antiochus Theos, joined forces by marriage. It's a common practice in the, in the ancient world. Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus gave his daughter to Antiochus uh, Theos as his wife. So the king of the south gives his daughter to the king of the north in an attempt to stop the warfare and to seal the breach. Just what the scripture is talking about. Now, the king of the north was already married to a woman whose name was uh, Laodicea. And being married to Laodicea, he promptly, at the offer, divorces her. And he marries the daughter of the king of the south, and her name is Berenice. And after two years, the king who is the descendant of the original king, Ptolemy Delphius, dies. Now, the king who marries his daughter, Antiochus, now felt no obligation to treat Berenice well and put both her and her son, his progeny, away. He divorced them. And when he divorced them, he took back his first wife. Laodicea. Now, have you ever heard the statement, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned? Listen to what this woman does. First thing she does is she gives an order to kill Berenice. And then she gives an order to kill her son, knowing that her husband who took her back, knowing that he could potentially be in line for the throne, arranges and has him executed. Then she puts her own son, Seleucus, on the throne, Seleucus Calaminius, why she couldn't have named him Fred, I have no <laughs> idea. That always kills me with this stuff, okay? Now, I want you to think about this. Daniel is getting this from this emissary of God. He's telling him a detail here. How do you think this? How can anybody at this time possibly know that somebody is going to divorce their wife, that he is going to take his divorced wife back when there's no political advantage in the woman that he married from the other country? She's going to get back by having him poisoned. She poisons her husband. And that she may arranges to have his ex-wife murdered and her son so he can't get on the throne and she's going to take her kid and put her kid on the throne. Where do you get this information? There's only one way. There is someone who sees it all before it happens. That's how it works. Now, verse 7. Well, wait a minute. I just want to read over verse 6 again. With those facts, listen to this and see if it fits. And at the end of some years, they shall join forces, marriage. For the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement, Berenice. But she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand, because they're dead. But she shall be given up with those who brought her with him, who begot her, and with him who, who strengthened her in her times. 
Now, verse 7. But from a branch of her roots, one shall arrive, rise in his place, who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail. History, again. Josephus. The history tells us that Berenice has a brother. And her brother hears that Laodicea murders his sister. He gathers a tremendous army together, now being the king, and he invades the north. And when he invades the north, he does away with them. And he prevails. He gets revenge. It's history. It's prophecy. It happened just the way the representative of God told Daniel. And he shall also carry their gods captive to Egypt. What a shame to have God so puny somebody can steal him. I don't know why you would give any credence to something that you could put in a box and carry off with you. Okay? With their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So a branch of Berenice's roots are her brother. He invades the north to exact revenge. Now, the king of the north, Seleucus uh, Callinicus, who had been defeated in Syria, tries to conquer the south and fails, and he goes home. Ninth verse. And the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south and shall return to his own land. Just exactly what history says happened. Verse 10. However, his sons shall, shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces and one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress and stir up, stir up strife. Seleucius had two sons, both attempted invasions of the southern kingdom, Egypt, and failed. Verse 11, and the king of the south shall be moved with rage and shall go out to fight with him. And with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of the enemy. The king of the south, Ptolemy Philip, uh, uh, Philippator, being attacked by Antiochus the Great, counterattacks and wins. That's history. Twelfth verse. And when he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up and he will be cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. The north fails. The real ruler of the south, uh, uh, Ptolemy, has the opportunity to crush the south at this time. That crush the north at this time. But because he becomes drunk, because he becomes a man of notorious, lascivious lifestyle, because he becomes the abject partier, because he's more interested in enjoying the benefits of being king, he passes up on the opportunity to completely crush his enemy. Now, 13th verse. For the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and with much equipment. 18 years later, historically, the king of the north attacks uh, uh, following the death of Ptolemy And he completely and totally attempts to destroy everything. And when he does, he does it with a mass blitzkrieg attack. Now, remember in verse 14, it talked about the timing of these events. The Jews at this time, make a critical mistake. They make the decision that they are going to align themselves militarily, 
Remember, they've returned. They're now they're in Palestine, and they link arms with the army that invades and loses. The reason that the king loses is because his counselors and his generals all commit treason. And they sell him out. And when he comes back, remember, he's positioned so that when he comes back, he goes back through Palestine. He decides he's going to take everything out on the Jews. Now, 14th verse. Now in those times, many shall rise up against the king of the south. Also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fail. He tells him the Jews are going to align themselves with the king involved in a failed attack, your people. So the king of the north shall come and build a siege mound and take a fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist. But he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. And he shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. Who was Daniel talking about in the glorious land? Israel. He's saying that this king is going to be angry because they lost and he is going to come through. Who is this? Antiochus, the general who went through and murdered thousands of Jews and finally even killed the high priest destroyed the temple, melted the gold into the bricks. Daniel's being told what's going to happen right down to who's going to be king and who's going to do it. 17th verse. Antiochus the Great conquers the south, the Egypt, Egypt, and has a hard time keeping control. He can win the war, but he can't win the peace. In other words, he's shown up and he's been a conqueror, but the insurgents are so strong that he can't keep control of the country. So he comes up with a plan, 17th verse. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of the whole kingdom and upright ones with him, thus shall he do. And he shall, and he shall give him the daughter of the woman to destroy it, but she shall not withstand him or be for him. 17 verse, Antiochus the Great, he cuts a deal to give his daughter Cleopatra, not the Cleopatra with Mark Antony, different Cleopatra. So from today forward, and you're something about Cleopatra, you can legitimately say which one, okay? Most of the world doesn't know that. So at any rate, he attempts to give his daughter Cleopatra to Ptolemy in an attempt to undermine him. Ptolemy plans to destroy the kingdom from within. So he sends his daughter in, has primed her to work against the king in every subtle undermining way. But she double crosses her father. She refuses to do, to do so, becomes a loyal wife to Antiochus, and not working for Antiochus, and refuses to work for him. She is loyal to her husband. She ends up marrying Ptolemy and is faithful throughout her entire life. Let's read it again. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall... And he, uh, 